Vincent J. Antondi is an associate professor of history at Montgomery College in Tacoma Park, Maryland. He holds a BA in economics from SUNY Potsdam, an MA in history from SUNY Oswego, a PhD in history from American University. In 2009, Antondi was named the director of research for American University's Nuclear Studies Institute in Washington, D.C. And while he was there as a director, uh, and he still is, he, ha he annually teaches in Hiroshima and Nagasaki alongside with the actual victims of the atomic bomb, the survivors of atomic bomb, and nuclear policy experts, and the various dignitaries. T. Moore. Harry. Harry I'm sorry, Harry T. Moore. One. Two, three, okay, because you know from last night, right? No. <laughs> okay, well, just quickly, uh, Harry T. Moore was an African-American educator, and he was a pioneer and the leader of civil rights movement, and he was the founder of the, of the branch of National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAACP. He was one of the uh, first people to start that in Florida. And what makes his story so interesting is that he and his wife, uh, who Henrietta, who was also a, an educator, they were victims of a bombing in their home in, in Mims, Florida on Christmas night in 1951. And they died in an ambulance on the way, well he died in an ambulance on his way to the hospital and she died a couple weeks later. Uh, and the interesting thing is that the Moors were the first NAACP members to be murdered for civil rights activism and Moore is known as, or is being called as the first martyr of the early stage of the African American Civil Rights Movement. So Professor Ntande uh, co-created this legacy program. He's a regular contributor to the Huffington Post, and we have posted a recent article uh, on our website, Arts and Culture, and on our homepage of Brooklyn for Peace, where he wrote on the 18th of this month on supporting Obama and nuclear disarmament. And it's a great article, so go online and read it. He has appeared publicly alongside Benjamin Jealous, Bobby Seale, Julian Bond, Tom Hayden, Daniel Ellsberg, Peter Kuznick, and Oliver Stone. Author of the book, African Americans Against the Bomb, Nuclear Weapons and Colonialism, and the Black Freedom Movement, let's welcome Professor Vincent J. Okay, first before we get started, I just want to thank uh, comments for having me for um, Brooklyn for Peace, for um, Charlotte, for and the organizers for bringing me here, for Word last night, and, and now here today. Thank you guys for coming out um, for this event. So sincerely, thank you. I'd like to first start explaining how this book project began. Um, it came out in January of 2015, and it was about 10 years in the making. Uh, my first trip to Hiroshima and Nagasaki was in 2005 when I was a graduate student at American University. And up to that point, all of my academic career and my career as a social and political activist had revolved around issues with the black freedom struggle and civil rights. Nuclear weapons were not really on my radar. And the first time I went to Hiroshima and met with atomic bomb survivors, I was so moved, I was so filled with guilt and anger now when I came back, I met with my advisor, my mentor at the time, Peter Kuznick, and I said, I have to find a way to combine these two passions of mine, eliminating racism and eliminating nuclear weapons. And he said to me, answer me one question. What did African Americans think about dropping the atomic bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki? And when I pitched this idea to colleagues, most of them said, you're not going to find much of a response because African Americans, understandably so, were not worried about this issue. They were too worried trying to gain their own freedom and equality. They didn't have time for this. Well, they were wrong. On June 6, 1964, a group of atomic bomb survivors and activists on a world peace study mission came to the United States, specifically to Harlem. Their trip was organized by an amazing Japanese American activist we lost recently, Yuri Kachiyama. And she said to them, while you're here, what is it that you want to do most? And the survivor said, meet Malcolm X. But Malcolm at the time was traveling through the Middle East, traveling through Africa. She didn't know if she could get a hold of him. She wrote him letters, wrote to his office, but to no avail. 
And the last day, she was having a reception at her apartment, and there was a knock at the door. And she opened the door, and there stood Malcolm. He came back. And he said to the survivors of the atomic bomb, you've been scarred by the atomic bomb, but we've also been scarred here. The bomb that scarred us was racism. He spent the day talking to them about imperialism, colonialism, and the Vietnam War. Because Malcolm understood what so many before him understood, which was that how these things were inextricably linked. How colonialism, how freedom here, how peace were the same fight. So my book examines those black activists who connected the fight for freedom in the United States with nuclear disarmament and liberation movements around the world. Now for so long, African American history, the way it's taught in this country, is completely separate from US history. Right? We're on the cusp of February for Black History Month, so let's jam in everything we possibly can for that month. I have some of my students that will say, where's White History Month? And of course, the answer is the other 11. <laughs> we even, if you look at textbooks, you have Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks and their nice, neat little categorical boxes, teach what's safe, and that covers black history. And over the last two decades, scholars have begun to look at the role of African Americans in foreign affairs and international relations, studying Pan-Africanism and colonialism movements. But where my book differs is that the majority of the scholars, the consensus is that any international relations, any foreign affairs involvement of the black community in the United States essentially ends in the 1950s when McCarthyism hits. But anti-communism spread through this country and severed those ties and so many groups fell mute. And that is true to a degree. But if you specifically look at the issue of nuclear disarmament, you will see that these bonds are not broken and they survived through the 1950s, into the 60s, 70s, 80s, and beyond. And so I started asking a series of questions. What role did it play in the black community that the first victims of the atomic bombing were non-white? What role did it play that the discrimination African Americans faced in this country led to a more critical critique of US foreign policy? What role did the black popular front play in these movements? When the U.S. dropped the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima on August 6, 1945, the majority of the American public rejoiced. Gallup ran a poll not long after, less than a month later, in which 85% of the American public agreed with Truman's decision to drop the atomic bombs. Roper ran a poll right after it in which showed that 22.7% of the American public wished Japan hadn't surrendered so we could have dropped more nuclear weapons and killed more people. Hmm. And in fact, no poll up until late October of 1945 ever showed more than 4.5% of American respondents critical of Truman's decision. But that was not the case in the black community. Now, of course, nothing is monolithic. This is not to say the entire black community was in agreement. But many in the black community, activists, poets, journalists, clergy, they didn't wait for an organized movement, and they were some of the, those that immediately came out against Truman's decision to use nuclear weapons in Japan. Now, some of this actually predates the atomic bombings. For some in the black community, and there was a split there, but for, for some of the black community, they looked at Japanese internment and said, here are a group of people being put in prisons for no crime they committed, but simply for their race. This could happen to us. We know that the Japanese had sent agents into the United States to work with the Nation of Islam and try to get black support. There was support built into the black community because it was Japan in 1935 that said publicly they were coming to the aid of Ethiopia when Mussolini invaded rather than the United States. Those like Du Bois had already visited Japan and was lionized there. So there was already support built in. And so one of the first places I started to look was the black press. Chicago Defender, the Pittsburgh Courier, the Baltimore Afro-American, these newspapers were critical in where the black community got their news, their opinions. <coughs> and overwhelmingly, the editors and the columnists were criticizing Truman's decision. But I wanted to go beyond that, and I wanted to see what the general public thought. So I started going through letters to the editor 
in all of these newspapers. And when I talk to young students at Book Talks and I say this, they don't understand because for them, they can go into a ProQuest database, put in a couple keywords and click search, it's done. I was in the Library of Congress on microfilm going through issue by issue, trying to read every letter to the editor. And what I saw, whether it was beauty shop owners or domestic workers or truck drivers, the same thing, overwhelmingly critical of Truman's decision. Even those that were happy the war ended were still critical of the decision to use nuclear weapons. Langston Hughes was one of the first to actually come out and question Truman's racism in this decision, writing in the Chicago Defender. And he was certainly right to do so. Harry Truman was, if not the most, certainly one of the most racist presidents in the United States history. This is a man that if you go through his journals and his diaries, his letters to his wife Bess, you will rarely ever find him referring to African Americans as anything other than the N-word. This is a man that sent a $10 check to the Ku Klux Klan when he was working in Missouri, but they sent it back to him because he refused to fire Catholic workers in his business. He used to brag in interviews that in his family you got slaves to start out the housekeeping with as a wedding present. And his mother openly supported the Confederacy and when she visited him at the White House said she'd rather sleep on the floor than ever step foot in Lincoln's bedroom. And this racism certainly expanded into Japan when we dropped the atomic bomb and he was told that we now instantly killed 140,000 people. The first thing he did was jump up and say, quote, this is the greatest thing in history. Zora Neale Hurston, who many argue is very apolitical throughout her career, not on this issue. I found a letter she wrote to her friend Claude Barnett in which she called Truman, quote, the butcher of Asia and was visibly upset that, her, that the black community was not rising up and doing more. I started to go through sermons of black pastors and overwhelmingly, again, I would see the same response, that we don't have enough religion to stop this Frankenstein that we let out and looking at the role that race plays in this decision. But probably of all the immediate response, the most critical, the loudest, came from the black popular front, especially W.E.B. Du Bois and Paul Robeson. Du Bois referred to Truman, uh, he compared him to Hitler, calling him one of the greatest killers of our day. He referred to Japan as, he said this would, this would set back the progress of colored nations for years and decades to come. And I'm so glad that the director of 12 Years a Slave, Steve McQueen, has now agreed to do a biopic of Paul Robeson, this amazing individual, this hero who was so lost in our history, completely ignored. My students have no idea who he is. And it was Robeson who immediately connected this to the colonialism issue. In June of 1946, they're at Madison Square Garden, there's a rally of 20,000 people. And he asked the question, where is the United States getting our uranium to make atomic bombs? And the answer, of course, was the Belgian-controlled Congo. He repeatedly would appear at May Day parades with an anti-nuclear banner. But so much of this changed in 1947 when Harry Truman issued what is now known as the Truman Doctrine. Long before George W. Bush ever said, with us or against us, it was Truman who put that line in the sand and said, you are either with us or you are with communism. And anti-communism spread through this country. The worst thing you could be labeled was to be black and red. And to be anti-nuclear now meant you were pro-communist. So yes, for a lot of groups, they fell silent. Groups like the National Negro Congress and the Council of African Affairs they ceased to exist. That's how hard it was for these groups to survive during this climate. Groups like the NAACP on this issue made a strategic decision at this time, and they made a sharp turn to the right, aligning themselves with Truman, hoping it would result in civil rights, which of course doesn't happen. But not everybody looked at peace as a bargaining chip. For those like Du Bois and Robeson and others, they saw what was happening now with the Korean War and we threatened to use nuclear weapons in Korea, they didn't want another Hiroshima in Korea. They weren't gonna let another non-white people, group of people be destroyed. They saw a real arms race happening because we dropped the bomb in 45 and the Russians get it in 49. But we developed the hydrogen bomb in 52, they caught us, they get it in 53. And now the arms race is actually on. And at the same time, there was a new peace movement starting. 
out of Soviet bloc nations. And out of this movement, out of Stockholm in particular, came what is now known as the Ban the Bomb Petition. Du Bois and Robeson, their wives and others, formed what is known as the Peace Information Center in the United States. And they took it upon themselves to try to get signatures for the Ban the Bomb Petition. They focused largely on the black community. Hundreds of millions of people signed this petition around the world. In the United States, over two and a half million signed it. Charlie Parker, Marian Anderson, and so many more. Now when I tell my students or younger kids today that there was this ban the bomb petition, they, they're, of course their attitude is a big deal. Because now they can sit on their couch and go on change.org and they're one click away from signing their petition and that's their activism or clicktivism, that, that's it. But there were real consequences back then to sign a petition like this. People lost their jobs. People were physically beaten. They were blacklisted. Their lives were destroyed. So if you look at 1950, when here we are on the cusp of the, of the civil rights movement, and it's African Americans in many ways leading the fight to ban the bomb and put their lives on the line for this petition, it's extraordinary. When the mid-1950s comes, so many things are happening in this country and indeed around the world. In 1954, we have Brown versus Board of Education, of course, desegregating schools. A year later, in 1955, we have the heinous murder of Emmett Till. In December of 55, Rosa Parks refuses to give up her seat on the bus. But in that same year, in 1955, while those things were happening, we had what is now known as the Bandung Conference in Indonesia, the first all-African Asian conference. And if you read the platform of that conference, you will see that they focused on three things, eliminating racism, colonialism, and nuclear disarmament. It seemed now more than ever, all these things were now starting to finally come together. And the person that puts it together during this time period is Bayard Rustin, another one who was completely forgotten in our history, iced out, marginalized because he was openly gay. Rustin's activism actually dates back to the 1930s, a huge career of activism. But for Rustin, he was involved in a peace movement that was dominated mostly by white middle class pacifists, and he was much more radical than them, and had to fight racism within these organizations. And so, in the late 1950s, two big things are happening that connect these issues. One is Ghana's independence under Kwame Nkrumah. The second, the French government, in the middle of being overthrown in Algeria, decide they want to be a world power and announce they're going to test their first nuclear weapon. Where? In Africa, in the Sahara. So Rustin puts together a team of US, British, and African activists working with Nkrumah, because for the people in Ghana, they were so worried about the nuclear fallout and what it would do to the cocoa industry. And their goal was to try to stop the French test. And Rustin goes to Africa, and not everybody wanted him to go. Hey, Phil Randolph were right, was writing letters saying, you need to be back here. You need to be working on the civil rights movement. We need to work on uh, the primaries and John Kennedy and so on and so forth. And Rustin's writing back saying, don't you understand? This is the most important thing I could be doing. Don't you see how these things are all related? I have to be here. And they try several times, physically putting their bodies on the line to try to stop the French test. And sadly, they don't, and the French finally detonate their first nuclear weapon. But I would argue he was, he was successful, because after this, the continent exploded in protests against the bomb. Nkrumah had follow-up conferences and events to try to highlight this issue. And there was such public pressure that eventually the French did abandon their nuclear testing. And of course, I can't talk to you about black anti-nuclear activism without discussing Dr. King. You know, for, for Dr. King, we're starting more and more to look at the radical side of Dr. King that is, again, so often ignored. That last year of his life, right, where he spoke out against capitalism and militarism, combined it with racism. But again, here the general consensus is that King doesn't really become radical, or King doesn't speak out on U.S. foreign policy until April 4th, 1967, exactly a year to the day he died with his Beyond Vietnam speech in which he called the United States, quote, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today. 
But if you study the nuclear issue, you will see that actually he was speaking out about this issue a decade earlier in 1957. In 1957, he made his first public comments in Ebony Magazine saying unequivocally he thought we should ban nuclear weapons. He consistently spoke at churches, black schools, colleges, and universities to the church, to black pastors, saying, calling nuclear weapons genocidal, suicidal. Saying, what does it matter if we're integrating lunch counters and then not being concerned about the world in which we're trying to integrate? It's absurd to fight for social justice if we're all dead from nuclear war afterwards. It doesn't make any sense. He pushed Kennedy for a nuclear test ban. And where was Dr. King learning all of this? From his wife, of course. Coretta Scott King was a long seasoned activist dating back to her days at Antioch College. She had worked in groups like Women's Strike for Peace and Women's International League of Peace and Freedom. And she was not alone. There were a bevy of black women who were working inside these organizations. The problem was, just like for Rustin, these black women were facing racism inside the organizations. There was a meeting in Detroit with Women's Strike for Peace in which black women wanted to carry signs that said desegregation or disintegration. And the white organizers said, no, we don't want to combine the issue of race with the bomb. And it was often Coretta who had to play peacemaker and had to try to broker deals through this. Lorraine Hansberry, who we all know from A Raisin in the Sun, was a militant, feminist, anti-nuclear activist. She famously went into a movie, a movie theater and saw a film on Hiroshima and Nagasaki and came out and yelled in the streets, no more Hiroshima's, not now, not ever. And the last play that she, uh, she ever wrote was actually about a nuclear holocaust and what happens to the two survivors. Throughout the Vietnam War, we see this because again, we threatened to use nuclear weapons in Vietnam multiple times, again, on non-white peoples. Even if you read the executive mandate number one of the Black Panther Party, you will see that when they talk about their struggle, they also talk about Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And I asked Bobby Seale, was that a conscious decision? He said, of course it was. We always looked at ourselves in an international manner. And indeed, Kathleen Cleaver and Eldridge were invited to speak in Hiroshima, and there was that connection as well. And in the 1970s, when so many people were physically exhausted, mentally exhausted from the Vietnam War and the black freedom struggle, this issue remained. You know, in 1976, there was what was called the Continental Walk for Nuclear Disarmament. People were going to come from all different corners of the country, meet in Washington, D.C. And for many, this was just simply a nonviolent act, a march, no big deal. Except if you were black and you were living in the South and you were partaking in this. Because the police made it clear they weren't going to help them. So on their march, they were beaten. If somebody took them in and let them stay in their homes on the way, their houses were vandalized. So there were real consequences for them. If we look at Jimmy Carter, who was the person in his administration pushing him to not further nuclear arms race? Andy Young, his UN ambassador, who was of course Dr. King's right-hand man. It was Andy Young who pressured President Carter to not build a neutron bomb. It was Andy Young who wanted to make sure that the South African government, the white apartheid government, gave up the nuclear weapons program, which they were building with the help from Israel. And they finally gave it up only when they knew Nelson Mandela was going to take power because they didn't want the bomb in, quote, black hands, even though Mandela would have dismantled it anyways because he hated nuclear weapons. And this was really all culminating into the 1980s when we had the largest anti-nuclear march in our history. When Ronald Reagan comes into power, it ignited this movement even more. Because Ronald Reagan came in and announced that he was going to balloon the defense budget by $180 million, and he was going to slash social programs by $140 million. He was going to expand our nuclear arsenal. And so a new campaign started called Bombs Over Babies, in which people started saying they were going to look at how they could take that money out of nuclear weapons and put it into economically depressed areas. You know, when I was writing this book, and I was writing for Huffington Post, I received a phone call from a gentleman in Washington, D.C., where I live, and he said, we need to meet. I said, okay. 
His name was Greg Johnson. He's in the book. And him and his wife, he was a librarian at Georgetown, African-American man, his wife. And he said, we were so interested in this issue in the 1980s. But every time we went to peace groups, every time we went to anti-nuclear groups, they said, there's not enough support in your community. And we could never get anybody in our community to talk about it. So they said, the hell with it, we'll make our own organization. And with one flyer and a rotary phone, they started the group Blacks Against Nukes. Grew to multiple chapters. Were featured in Essence and Ebony and Jet Magazine. Were asked to travel to Hiroshima and speak to delegations there. Ordinary citizens doing extraordinary things. And I'm so glad that we now have the resurgence of a politically and socially conscious athlete. You know, I was down in Florida and I taught in Sanford, which is the area I was, where Trevon Martin was murdered. I was actually teaching um, the death of Emmett Till uh, when Trevon Martin's 911 tapes came out. But it was so refreshing to see LeBron James throw his hoodie up when he was playing in Miami before anybody had to tell him, any publicist had to tell him to do so. Seeing athletes now wearing I Can't Breathe t-shirts. Serena Williams, what she's been doing for Black Lives Matter. We're seeing that again. A throwback to Muhammad Ali and John Carlos and Tommy Smith. The complete opposite of those like Michael Jordan. But there was another group in the 1980s that was just like this. They were called Athletes United for Peace. Professional football players, basketball players, baseball that were working with Soviet athletes and that were working to bring peace and nuclear disarmament in this country. And then of course you had the June 12th, 1982 march right here in New York City, in which over a million people got together to march against nuclear weapons, the largest march we've ever had. What a lot of people don't know though is when that march was being formed and organized, the lead organizers did not want there to be any issues of race involved. And so, under the leadership of the amazing, the great Reverend Herbert Daughtry, who is ill right now and I know is going to get better and is going to be with us for another 20, 30 years to come, great man that he is, he put together what is known as the Black United Front, saying that we have to combine these issues of race and nuclear disarmament and with help from people like Ozzie Davis and Ruby Dee and Shaka Khan and Toni Morrison and so many more, they merged together. 50% of the leadership that day was black, marching through Bed-Stuy, marching through Harlem. And there was also a young reporter covering that event, Barack Obama. You know, Obama was the hardest part for me to write about this book. I knew I was going to have to address it, looking at the subject matter. But as a historian, the worst thing that I can do is to predict and then be wrong, right? Who's going to read the book years later? So I'd be very careful on that. <laughs> and I just wrote about this in that recent article. Uh, it's, it's really the, the paradox of how, how to support Obama, or, or if you do, in that nuclear disarmament. Because President Obama, as a student at Columbia, and as a candidate for president, in the Senate was clearly against nuclear weapons. Nuclear disarmament was something that was very, he was very passionate about. When he becomes president, he talks about it in his inauguration, and then a few months later, he gives what is now known as the Prague speech. The most anti-nuclear speech any president in U.S. history has given, with possibly the exception of President John F. Kennedy's commencement address in 1963 at American University, dubbed the Peace Speech. And I take students from around the country every year with American University's Nuclear Studies Institute to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And I remember going that year after Obama gave the Prague speech. He had done so much. He pushed through the New START Treaty when others told him not to. He got countries like Ukraine and Argentina and Chile and Mexico to turn over the nuclear weapons making materials. He was marching forward on this issue. And that year in Japan, he actually had Ambassador Ruz, the ambassador to Japan, attend the peace ceremony in Hiroshima, the first time a US ambassador ever went. I remember how elated the people of Japan were, especially the survivors. 
I would walk through the Peace Park and citizens were handing me literally stacks of letters saying, send these to your president, thank him for what he's done. Mayor Akiba started a campaign called the Obama Majority, where I would see Japanese citizens wearing Obama Majority t-shirts. I was proud to be American that year. It's always a butt with Obama, right? It's a frustrating thing with him. Uh, and I, I actually wrote another piece for Huffington Post called the, the butt. Um, we, we got health care, we didn't get that public option. Right? Ended the war in Iraq, but we have all this drone warfare, right? So it's always a butt with him, it's so tough. The problem with this issue is he didn't just, it wasn't just a butt, he actually went backwards. Now here's a man that gets the Iran deal, which to me is the most important thing he's done in his presidency. Deserves enormous praise. It's heroic. You know, it drives me crazy when people say, in early in his presidency, they would say, is he black enough? Is he doing enough for the black community? It's how you look at that. Who are we talking about? Because if, as a result of the Iran deal, there's no war, how many non-white lives did he just save then as a result of that? But then, as we thought in his second term, maybe he would make that sharp turn to the left like John Kennedy did after the Cuban Missile Crisis. And certainly in some ways he did with Cuba and others. Not on this issue. He actually goes backwards. He took money out of non-proliferation programs and put it into building new nuclear weapons. He has this relationship on this Asia-Pacific Asia pivot with this extreme right-wing Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. He moves forward to massively expand the Okinawa Air Base, which is horrific for the people of Okinawa. Women who are being raped, things being vandalized, violence, no need for it. And now his new budget calls for tens of billions of dollars for smarter nuclear weapons, smaller nuclear weapons, and he's on course to spend a trillion dollars over the next 30 years, we are as a country, on nuclear weapons. If we look from Reagan to now, he's not going to end up dropping the number of nuclear weapons less than any of the presidents before. So where do we go from here? What can we learn from this? One key thing is that I think this work, this book shows that movements should not be separated. Whether it's environmental racism in Flint, whether it is what is happening in cities like Baltimore and St. Louis, whether it's nuclear disarmament, these issues are connected. When I talk and advise and meet with folks in Black Lives Matter trying to let them or help them understand that how can we talk about broken down infrastructure in Baltimore Money not there to replace lead pipes in places like Flint, and yet we're willing to spend a trillion dollars on nuclear weapons when we have enough to blow the world up ten times over. These issues are connected. And when we study this and we see it, a black community that for so long has been in the abyss in such misery fighting for their lives in this country, wield their collective power to make a more peaceful world. It's extraordinary. So, now, I don't know where we're going to go from here. I don't know what's going to happen in Obama's last 10, 11 months. But I don't put that on him. I put it on us. Because he never said, yes, I can. He said, yes, we can. And everything that Obama's done, he's been pushed to do it. And he knows that, which is why when he was asked early on, would Dr. King support your candidacy, he said no. He'd be in the streets making me do what I said I was going to do. It's why I've publicly for the last couple of years been pushing him to visit Hiroshima. The survivors, their average age is over 80. They are dying, they are so scared that when they die, nobody's gonna carry on their story. And I think symbolically, if he visited there as the first sitting president, it would be enormous. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. John Kerry, thank you. John Kerry, uh, they announced John Kerry is going to visit in April, which will be the highest ranking official we've ever had. And Caroline Kennedy visited when she was named ambassador. And so, what I think the most important thing to do is to keep pushing and keep teaching how these movements are connected. And the best thing we can do is learn from Malcolm X, who understood how these movements were inextricably linked and best understood that the fight was never been about civil rights. It has and always will be about universal human rights. Thank you.
before we do that, um, first of all, uh, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. And the favor I'm going to ask is, you know, last night when I heard uh, Vincent and Tandy speak, and today again, and I, got, I went home, I got to thinking about how, you know, education, for us to get information like this, a lot of times we have to go to a college. You know, I don't know how much money we've got to spend for, uh, you know, semesters of college to go to get it. And here it is, we have provided uh, an inside information for people right now here. You don't have to pay the millions of dollars that you have to pay where your great-great-grandkids will have to end up paying your your uh, school funds. And a lot of information I've come to realize is not easily accessible. And it isn't always true. So we've got books out there and bios and things that are written that sometimes are not exactly true. And so we are really blessed today to have a gentleman who has such a passion uh, for true information and to take his time out to write a book to inform us of, of a movement that I am a part of and live in every day. And so I wanted to thank you so much for sharing that. And also, we can't do this for free. We'd like to. And we invite everybody to come out and we say free admission. But in reality, when you think about it, we have t you know, to provide materials for you to sign, to go out with tables in, in the uh, we go out to the, the farmer's market on the weekends and we provide petitions for you to sign. And Mr. Antandi mentioned the other day about there was Move On had a virtual march, a virtual, was it March? A, health, a, a virtual march, okay? Now, <laughs> that is really easy, right? You sit at home and you just sign stuff. But Brooklyn for Peace, we're out there. We're out there in the streets, we're out there at farmer's markets. We have a wonderful young lady, Melissa, who is our program coordinator. Thank you, Melissa. She makes these flyers up for us. She was also helping serve back there at the, at the bar when Melissa's team quit on her today. So, yeah, it's like what more can happen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass around this uh, donation, and I'm going to ask you for your help to contribute what you can. And there's other ways that you can also participate. You can volunteer. We can always use volunteers. Oh boy, can we use volunteers. And you can also become a member if you're not already. So before we uh, start with the Q&A, we're going to be back passing this around uh, for you. And do, are you guys enjoying this so far? Yes. 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 It's mind blowing, right? Yes. I mean, it's like, woo, OK. Um, makes me want to have my, you know, pick out my hair so I have a fro, you know, because I got my piece here, right? Okay, so I'm going to open the floor up for some questions. We're going to pass, are we passing these around? Oh. I have so many hats today, and I also have to knock water on Mr. Antonio's phone again before we're over. Yes. So, you want to go ahead? Good. Uh, Good. It's, it's yes. great to see you again. Um, you can uh, come to New York, Brooklyn, Staten Island next. Hey, <laughs> All right. Um, I was actually, uh, you know, uh, loved your idea of a campaign to push Obama to go to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, are you the only person who's talked about this, or is there something going on? So, um, yeah, I wrote a couple articles for Huffington Post about him going. Um, it seems like, I thought the best approach was, because I know they get read, those, that's a way to get, they get retweeted, they get reposted, so on and so forth. So um, there's been different times, not just the ceremonies on August 6th or 9th. I don't think it has to be those ceremonies. So there's been other times where countries are meeting in Japan or in Hiroshima, and you can go then. So it might not be as politically, you know, a landmine if you do that. Um, so I wrote those articles, and then I started getting more people like yourself asking, can we do something? Started getting emails, can we do something? So I, I started a petition about a year ago, maybe. Um, it was on change.org. Uh, and that spread around to various groups in the peace movement and nuclear disarmament groups and so on and so forth, but it got to a certain level and then kind of petered out. So, um, and the thing is, his advisors, various advisors at different times in his presidency have said 
he, he, want, he wants to go, he'll go. And in fact, in his first year, we now know from WikiLeaks, he was going to go. He wanted to go. And it was the Japanese government that told him no. Mm -hmm. They thought it would be too controversial, they didn't want him going, they didn't want to open up different wounds, things of that nature, it wasn't politically right, so they're the ones that asked it. So, Again, on this issue, it's, it's particularly frustrating and, and perplexing because to try to figure out what's in his heart, what he really wants, and then why isn't he doing certain things. So in this last year, you don't need re-election anymore. This is it. This August would be it. Um, he may go as an ex-president, but I'd like to see him go. And, and again, I think symbolically it would, it would mean a lot. That, and I think the other thing that's we can try to do at this point, so we have to kind of look at what can really be accomplished now is, is trying to get him to take some of these nuclear weapons off hair trigger alert. I think that's another one that's doable at this point we need to focus on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yes? Can you tell us why Obama has reversed his policy? Uh, absolutely not. I, I've given up trying to figure out what's in Obama's. Um, I, I don't know because, again, you look at certain things. Um, when the New START Treaty got passed, at that point, we could put the onus on, on the Republican obstructionists, right? It was John Kyle at the time, was no longer in the Senate in Arizona. He was the one that held kind of the votes, and what he said was, I'll deliver the New START Treaty, but um, you're not going to get the DREAM Act, and you're going to have to promise $85 million in a modernization package. But that wasn't written in stone, so that could have been, we could have just gone back on that. But in the, se the, the tougher part is the second term, that he doesn't have to face re-election, he could go this way. Now... I don't know if, and I'm just, again, I don't know if in retrospect they're looking at it as the legacy on this issue will be the Iran deal um, and what he's done there. Um, I don't know if they're looking at it and say, well, the world it would have been different had Putin not come back in power and had we not had you know all of these things and instability happening. So I don't know, but again, it's I put it on us. If there were a million people in the street demanding he do something, he would do something, right? Um, gets back to move on, right? That move on issue came during the healthcare debate. When the healthcare debate broke out, um, so many people that were in favor of it didn't do anything. And it was the Tea Party that rose up and made a stink. And I got an email from move on during that that said we're gonna have a virtual march on this day. And that was the last straw for me. I said, well, I'm gonna get an avatar, are you serious? Like, this is ridiculous, <laughs> this is not gonna happen. So um, I, I do put that, and, I, and again, so I think, because you can see what moves the needle with um, you know, gay marriage or um, dreamers or Black Lives Matter. So I think what's important is to let these younger kids, they're not as invested in this issue the way they are with the environment and other issues. And I think part of that's because for them, they've grown up in a world with nuclear weapons their whole lives. It's very abstract, they're kind of divorced from it to them. They're always gonna be there, nobody's gonna be crazy enough to use them, and that's it. So I think the approach to bring them in is to understand the economic issue there of where that money could be better spent. So you can't talk about raising minimum wage and building communities and then look at where this money is being spent on nuclear weapons. I think that's a better way in. Um, so I, I think that's another part. But to answer your question of where Obama's head is on this, I mean, I, I don't know. You don't know what pressure he's getting from the brass, from the military. Um, you know, look how Kennedy was boxed in, you know, um, through that. So, you know, they can't stand him. So, I don't, you know, but um, I don't have much, well, I have hope in our generation, the younger generation, I don't have much hope in the candidates who are coming after him either on this front. So, yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Um, I, I'm sorry. Second question, just uh, on the TPP yeah. and how it relates to nuclear weapons. Um, you, you mentioned something about you know he shifted mm -hmm. to the pivot to Asia right. and with uh, you know nuclear weapons are all over the issue right. of the pivot to Asia. Right. What's your take on that? Yeah, it's it's horrible. Um, so what, what is the TPP? So the, the Trans-Pacific Trade Agreement um, with Asia. So there was an agreement. With the, the thought process was, and this was really being pushed from Hillary when she was Secretary of State. The thought process was that the Middle East, uh, for various reasons, was not going to be the hotbed anymore, the main player with foreign policy. We are going to make this conscious shift and focus on China, focus on Asia. Well, Shinzo Abe, the extreme right-wing Prime Minister of Japan, he gets elected in Japan basically on arguing about the economy, that he could help the economy. When he gets in there, he's dreadful. 
Um, it's not just the expansion of the, of the base in Okinawa. He actually just destroyed the peace constitution uh, that was written right after World War II, which is horrifying. So now Japan is starting to remilitarize, and the US is remilitarizing that area. Um, and of course, this is causing tensions with China. And so you have a whole area now that is just building and building more and more, not just nuclear weapons, conventional weapons, et cetera. Um, and again, why Obama's doing this is mind boggling. Um, I'm constantly in the Japanese newspapers with Noam Chomsky and Dan Ellsberg and, and others. Um, we're writing about this and signing petitions there because uh, meeting with the Okinawan government because they don't, they don't want it. Um, so, you know, when he got when he got reelected and when he put Caroline Kennedy in, we thought this was a good move. She immediately goes to the peace parks in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. You know, obviously her, who she is, but she's actually right in line, and she's been all for the Okinawa base and the TPP and, and this pivot. So, and again, Hillary Clinton certainly is in favor of it as well. So. Um, yeah, I'm certainly not in favor of it, and I see it all the time when I go to Japan, and, um, you know, it's, it's dangerous. Dangerous. Yes? You mentioned oh, wait, sorry. Clinton. I'll okay. get everybody in here with it. So, go ahead. I'll get everybody in. We got time. Go ahead. Sure. You mentioned Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. Has Bernie Sanders been approached to anything about it? So, there is a, a group that I work with all the time uh, called Global Zero. Global Zero is an, an anti-nuclear group uh, that is fairly new, but they're younger. They, have, they put a lot of emphasis on recruiting younger kids. Um, and I think they're, they're really good on social media. Um, they really know how to use their budget. And so what they've done is they've bird dogged all of the presidential candidates uh, repeatedly. And so if you, and you can even check them out on, on Twitter and stuff, what you will see is they will, and, and they constantly are sending me pictures and we're talking about it because they will go to events, all of them, Republican and Democrat, and they will wait in the rope line, they will get in the town hall, and they will ask about nuclear weapons. And you can see all these candidates' answers. Now, Bernie Sanders has said he's not in favor of nuclear weapons, we need to do something about that, but um, the reality of what he'll be able to do when he gets in is, you know, how much are these are campaign things and so on and so forth. So, again, I, I, don't, I don't put emphasis on candidates, I put it on, on us. That, that's what gives me hope, is, is the kids, is younger activists. Um, Yes. Sorry, yes, and then I'll come back around. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, yeah, Vincent, you said this before about uh, Mr. Obama does not really, you know, make um, foreign policy. How, my question to you is, the way, what I've seen growing up, foreign policy has always been the same, same old, same old, same old suit. And so the question is, who is it that makes the dictates for what the policy is and right. for the administration. So because it looked like it was the same for the whole right. So there's a so there's a there's kind of the larger kind of macro issue that you're talking about, which is do we have what Eisenhower warned us about, which was the military industrial complex, that the people that are making policy are the weapons manufacturers, the DOD, people that are buying our senators and buying our congressmen. Um, how much of this is being dictated by companies like Lockheed Martin? If you're a congressman and the main employer in your district is a weapons manufacturer, well, you're going to cow cow to them because those are the people that are going to get jobs and get you votes. And so there's all of that corruption that we think about in a larger sense. Um, but in a micro sense, I don't think we can say, you know, I don't agree when people sit there and say, well, Obama's bush light, nothing's changed. Um, I don't agree with that. I, I think that, that things would have certainly been different with the John McCain administration, whose response to Iran was bomb, bomb, bomb Iran, versus this president who does an Iran deal. Um, I think, so, and that's not to say you shouldn't, I don't criticize his drone warfare and things of that nature. I certainly do. Um, but, I mean, somebody like President Kennedy, for example. You had Eisenhower who came in, ballooned our nuclear weapons arsenal to the 20,000 by the time he left. Um, you know, John Kennedy, by the time when he died, John Kennedy wanted to get, he had plans to get out of the Vietnam War. He promised not to invade Cuba. He wanted to end the Cold War. He was trying to make peace with Khrushchev and with Castro. Um, he had a nuclear test ban treaty, so... It was hardly the same old, same old, so. Yeah, but my question was, who, who, is, who is it that you would say, you know, puts the stamp on what the foreign policy should be? Well, again, it depends on the president, right? So is the president no, 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 listening? No, it's the same thing that's been 
Right, in macro sense you can say it's the same, but again, President Obama, for example, when he had to do his Afghanistan policy when he first came in, he has Petraeus and he has McChrystalism all together, he also has Joe Biden, he also has Hillary, and it's, he made the decision to go 30,000 strong in the surge and then cut it out by a certain date, so I think it depends on who they're surrounding themselves with. But I do understand your point, it's well taken, that it's a larger issue that we've had this empire that's continued um, really since World War One, really balloons in World War Two. it's just been a U.S. empire no matter who the president's been, and I, and I get that wholeheartedly and don't disagree with that to a large extent. Um, yes, sir. What about Muslims? What about Muslims? Yes, you, you, I hear it. You talk about something called Muslim. Something called Muslim? Yeah, when you are you are talking. No. Did I? No. Well, maybe a reference to oh, when Japan yeah, assisted the, uh, the Islam, you know, when they... Well, that was Ethiopia. Um, you know, the nation of Islam. Oh, the nation, oh, the nation of, Islam. of Islam, yeah. yeah. The uh, oh, Japanese... Uh, the, the nation of Islam. Yeah. Yeah. That's different the, from... The nation of Islam. Yes, that's different from Orthodox, Shia, Sunni, Islam that you would think of in that sense. The nation of Islam was a different group, started in the United States, uh, originally started by uh, w, w. Farad Muhammad, then passed on to Elijah Muhammad. Um, that was a group that was in the black community, and when World War II happened, Japan, um, the Japanese government actually had sent agents into the United States to try to work with Elijah Muhammad to try to get black support um, during World War II. Actually, if you look at when Malcolm X um, was going up to try to get out of serving, he at one point said, you know, Tokyo is my friend and things of this nature. So that's where I can certainly give you references of where to look up more of that relationship between Japan and the Nation of Islam or the black community as well. But that, that might be. Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali. You know, in the big mosque in Manhattan, mm. in the year 1980, and I have a diploma of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Mm. Okay. What is all from all this? What do you think? The religion. I, I have to go not with politics, religion only. How and what is? Peace exists in every religion, Judaism, <coughs> Christianity, or Islam. You're asking me what religion I think is peace. You read all this? I, I mean, I'm... A, you, you read do about I, Judaism, you read about Christianity, you read about Islam, or not? Yes, not, I, I, I am familiar with all three religions. As very good. I am also. But I don't know if I'm an expert to dissect no. in, in 15 minutes which one in is more peaceful and so on and so forth. So, in short. Um, but in I'm, short. Well, I'm certainly willing to talk offline, but I'd like to get more questions about the we book are, topic. We are here because of religious. I'm not here to, for politics. Okay. Peace comes not from the people of politics. Peace comes between the religion. If peace don't come with religion, I will not be here. Okay. I'm here to this organization almost 30 years. 30 years. Anyway, from your point of view, you have read everything. Which one? I have a rabbi become Muslim. Priest become Muslim. I don't know why, myself. Okay, um, again, I'm not going to analyze all different religions today and which ones are the most peaceful. Um, I'm okay. here, not for politics. I, I okay, so uh, let me just interject right here for a second. Um, you know, I'm a Buddhist, so you didn't even mention <laughs> Buddhism at all. But what we want to do is politics, we're talking about politics, we're talking about religion, and it's very different. They're, they're not separate because we're talking about our own belief system, our own moral code. Whether or not I respect you as a human being and I recognize the sacredness of you as a human being, that is what's most important That's in how it. we deal with everybody. We are all right. human beings. Exactly. Not, absolutely. Not and you're absolutely. Else. Exactly. So what we're trying to do here, though, is to have uh, Vincent Antande talk about how 
the African American struggle, which is what I am and what I deal with. I grew up in the South where I had to ride in the back of the bus I and have, drink out of colored on the I have fountains. some people from Africa. Yeah, well, I was living in it, so yeah, I would okay. like to continue this, and then he's going to be around to sign his book, and we can even talk a little bit more about this, but, you know, I want to get everybody's question in, if you don't mind, please. Uh, yeah, Thank I wanted so to ask you what luck you've had when you've been talking to younger African Americans about interesting them in the question of nuclear weapons, because one of the really frustrating things I find teaching in college is that my undergraduates even when they're taking courses like you know on the Cold War and we talk endlessly about the arms race, etc., they think that is really all history. You know, they are so profoundly not afraid, and you know, I keep telling you, you should be very, very afraid. Right. So, uh, can you talk a little bit more? Because you said you, you know. Yeah. So, it's stunning when I've gone. I've been on this book tour of the the demographics of the crowds when I'm getting asked by um, a peace organization to come and speak or a black studies um, department being asked to speak. Uh, a lot of groups have felt this book has helped open the door with diversity. There's a real push to get more um, different groups of people in the environmental movement, in a peace movement. Uh, there's a push with African Americans in the STEM fields, uh, nuclear physicists, things of that nature, and I've, this book has been hopefully helpful in that regard. I think uh, what I've seen, uh, my experience is, where I teach, I teach African American history at Montgomery College. The demographics of my students are 49% are African American, 50% are from all various parts of the continent of Africa. Uh, a lot of my students are from Ethiopia, where I am, we have the largest contingent of Ethiopian students in the country, and 1% uh, are white. And I teach courses on slavery in the fall, um, civil rights and other courses in the spring. And one of the biggest challenges for me, and it does tie into this, um, is the disconnect between my African and African American students where my African students will tell me they are told, whether they're coming from Nigeria, Ghana, Cameroon, Ethiopia, not to associate with African American students. They will say, we are told that they are lazy, they treat their pants, don't talk to them, don't be them. Then I have my Ethiopian students will say, well, we're not African, we're Ethiopian, we're not West Africa, we were never enslaved, we're kings, we're queens, so there's even a bigger hierarchy. Then my African American students will say, don't call us African, African booty scratcher, that's a diss, that's an insult, we're not that, no, 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 we're African American. And to explain to them that whether it's when a bomb gets dropped or a cop is beating you, he's not beating you saying, wait, are you from Angola, Cameroon, or Anacostia? No, they're not asking you questions first, they're just killing you because you're black. So to try to bridge that. Now, how does that get to, to, to this issue? Because when you can start explaining environmental racism, when you can start explaining how African Americans were used as guinea pigs, um, black soldiers for nuclear testing, how the uranium still today in parts of Africa, and try to link that colonialism piece together, that pan-Africanist piece together, trying to constantly make them aware that what happens to other non-white peoples around the world and what happens to them is inextricably linked. So it's something you're trying to constantly do. Um, I think we've seen a real increase with, with black youth and the environmental movement, climate change. So perhaps we can use an extension of that to work in this piece. But it is certainly an uphill battle. Like I said, when I'm meeting or talking with groups, especially like Baltimore and places like this, of economically depressed, lack of opportunity, broken down infrastructure, I think the best way in is to say, well, you know, let's make sure we're putting pressure on a candidate who's willing to spend a trillion dollars over 30 years on this to put that money where it could be better spent. That was successful in the 80s. I think it could be successful um, again. So I think that's a part of it. But, um, you know, it's today, really, you have to be internet savvy. You have to be social media savvy. You have to find, you know, there's a lot of those things. And again, I think Global Zero is doing a pretty good job of it, but it's, a, it's an uphill battle. It really is. Neil? I think Tom had a question. Sure. Yeah. Hi. Yes, sir. First of all, thank you very much. I learned a lot today already. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how the intersection of, of uh, you know, what you've been studying and in, in mass mass movements on the ground? Because if I'm hearing you right, that's you're saying that without that movement from below, we don't make change. So I'd like you to just you know expand a little bit further on that if you could. And what are the conditions of mass movements as you understand it that you know allow a given movement to really mm -hmm. flourish? Yeah, I think uh, I, mean, I think you're right. I think this this book um, 
is in many ways about movements um, as, as a whole and how movements work. Um, I think a mass movement is beneficial, but I also think it's not the only way, right? I think that, you know, you mentioned the youth. I think we have to get more youth to run for political office as well. I mean, look at the candidates, and I'm thinking there's not a 40-year-old out there. There's not, I mean, this is seriously what I mean with. I don't, I think we need to get more youth in local politics and state politics and national politics. I think we need grassroots activism. Uh, and as far as how movements build, it is a little tricky now because I think there's value in social media. I was somebody who resisted social media for a very long time. I only have Twitter. I don't have Facebook. I, you know, I'm not, I'm much more in favor of being in the streets and these kind of things. Um, and real grassroots organizing. And I think there's value in it, especially when they're trying to cut the media out in a foreign country, and it's the only way you can get the information out. But I also think it creates a lot of armchair activists, people that just have really never done that grassroots stuff, but just because they're an internet personality, now they're, they're out there, and that can be problematic as well for a movement. So whenever students or activists are asking me what they can do, which is essentially what we're saying here, what can you do, there's not one answer. Everybody in this room has a gift. I can't draw a stick figure to save my life. I can't hold a tune. I can sing nothing. All I got is my voice in terms of this and writing. It's what you choose to do with it is your gift back. And so if you're an artist and you use that art for social cause, if you are a musician, if you are a journalist, if you are a photographer, and I think it's all of that that, that works right, that, that has to work. Um, and of course down to, to voting and so on and so forth. But yeah, I think pushing is, Essential, and we see that. We see that whether it's immigration, we see that whether it's gay marriage, we see that, I mean, um, over and over again. I, mean, I talk to my students all the time and say to them, that were, they don't understand there was a time when black and white couldn't get married in this country. And I, they, they say, that's crazy. I'm like, yes. And in 20 years from now when I'm teaching, I'm gonna say there was a time when if you were gay, you couldn't get married. And the students gonna go, that's crazy. Like, do you see how, so <laughs> things, you know, and, I, and explain to these kids that in our country, we don't have these revolutions where we storm the White House and the leader flees in exile. We topple the government and start over. And in our country, it's slow, it's a slog, it's not fast enough. But things do change. And uh, it just takes, you know, time and it's not fast enough for us. You know, even somebody like Dr. King, to tell my kids that it's, what Dr. King spent most of his life doing is essentially this, being in a basement with 10 other activists just talking and arguing and trying to strategize, not the marches. That's not you know, what, what he spent most of his time doing. So um, you know, I'm obviously, as a teacher, a big fan and think that you have to start with education. Um, and that's, that's, the, that's a key. Um, but I'm very hopeful. My colleagues and I, you know, they're, they're more pessimistic than me. Um, my students, I've seen what they can do, whether it was my dreamers in Florida, um, the Dream Defenders and they organized after Trevon, or whether it's my students in, in DC now, um, I think this generation is amazing. I think millennials are not narcissistic or self-absorbed, I do not buy that. Um, whether it's climate change, whether it's electing the first black president, I've, I've seen what they can do and their story's not written yet, so they really do give me hope on that that's, I really believe that. Can we have time for two more questions? Sure. And again, I'm not going anywhere. So let me get some more people in here. Yes, go ahead. Hi. Oh, I will be in here, sir. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Jesse. I'm curious if you have any tips for Brooklyn for Peace, which is, if I venture to say, an organization of older white people. Yeah. Um, and I think you pointed to a lot of ways in which white organizers have exhibited racism in the past 50 years. Um, any tips or ideas for how BFP could? Avoid some of those pitfalls. Yeah, I think uh, when you go back, when I went back and I looked like at the papers of Sane and P section, a lot of these groups, and went back and looked at all their papers and all their back and forth minutes to their meetings, all these things for this book. There was a real dilemma there of those in these groups that thought there, it should be a single issue, only nuclear disarmament. Um, or only an anti-war, and others saying, no, we need to combine it with others. Now, I am somebody that falls in the latter. I believe in the intersectionality of movements. I believe these things are connected, and that only helps when we connect these movements. So I think that's one thing. I also think, um, especially with some of the older, more established peace action, peace groups that have been white, middle-class pacifists for so long, there is a sense in some ways of, a, of almost like a purity test, a purist attitude, which I think has been problematic and can hurt. I know that 
for example, a group like Global Zero is kind of new on the scene and they're socially media savvy and they got some money and they make a splash at the White House with bank, you know, they do a lot of those things. And I know that that works. You have to look at strategies and how you can reach young kids today. Um, when I worked for the Hip Hop Caucus during the Iraq War, one of the things we did was the Make Hip Hop Not War campaign using hip hop artists to speak out against the war in Iraq. It worked. Um, in that regard. So I, I think that's, you gotta keep looking at that. One uh, a book project I'm, I'm gonna start working on um, shortly is comparing and contrasting the anti-Vietnam War movement with the anti-Iraq War movement and what was done right, what was done wrong, what can we learn from those things. So I think we're constantly still learning. Um, but I think climate change model has been really good. I think um, also looking at the marriage equality movement, I mean, what they were able to do in a very quick amount of time to get that turned, it's pretty remarkable. So, um, and I'm willing to talk to you offline, I'll give you my card, you can email back and forth about different things and strategies, um, but I also know it's tough, you need a budget to do those things. You need money to go to have college field officers and to recruit students and things of that nature. You know, um, I wrote a, a piece in Huffington Post um, titled Peace is Not Weak. I think that's another thing that peace is looked at as weak. Peace, the word peace, it's looked at as hippie, it's looked at as weak, it's old. It's a, and I couldn't disagree more and try to, you know, discuss that. So the more we can push that, you know, I think the, the better it'll be too. So, mm -hmm. go ahead, you've got your hand up. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm from Brooklyn for Peace, but I'm also a member of a Pan-African organization. And uh, you touched on something about the problem between African-Americans sure. and continental Africans that yes. come here and so true because that's the challenge that we've been facing mm -hmm. in our organization, trying to get the, the common bond that, that ties, uh, you know, that binds uh, the two people. Um, I think, uh, you know, when people like Malcolm X and, and Kwame Nkrumah and uh, Du Bois could see early on, you know, uh, that there was a connection between the struggle here yes. and the liberation movement yes. over there. Unfortunately, uh, after the liberation <laughs> right. of those countries and, and uh, civil rights, or whatever, at least considered done, uh, you know, the next generation just literally just dropped the ball. <laughs> the ball. Well, but, well, no, in the sense, but the African American, uh, what I wanted to say though is this is an eye opener of what you told us today about the involvement of African American, all these civil rights leaders and individuals that we've been reading about, how involved they were in the uh, you know, campaign to ban the bomb. Uh, but this is not really the history that, that our children get. You know, right. this, the safe history, as you mentioned, right. does not mention these things. Uh, it, was a, it was quite an eye opener. Thank you for doing that. Thank you. This is uh, remarkable. Yeah, the Pan-African uh, connection, you know, yeah, it can date back to obviously slavery, but also Marcus Garvey really focused on it, yeah. and then we had, you know, Du Bois and, and Robeson and others, and it's, it's whether it was Stokely, Kwame or, um, you know, there's this, always this affinity uh, during the Vietnam War, you know, Black Liberation Army, the Black Panther Party, they, I, they had an affinity with the Vietnamese people, saw that, Muhammad Ali, mentioned Muhammad Ali, right, um, no Vietnamese ever called me the N-word, right, he, the, the, there was that affinity there, and we even have it in, in the 1980s, during the golden era of hip-hop, groups like Poor Righteous Teachers, African Bambada and Zulu Nation, BDP and KRS-One. These groups were constantly trying to call Quest, De La Soul. There was a connection there where they were bringing these, these things. There was the African medallions that people were wearing, cross colors, clothes. That was what the golden era of hip hop was all about. Um, so where has that gone? Um, you know, we, we're starting to see it in, with some groups today, especially um, with Dream Defenders and others with Palestine. They see an they've made trips there, they're seeing an affinity there, they're seeing a relationship there, but getting them to understand that what happens in India, what happens in Pakistan, what happens in El Salvador, that, that it is connected. And I think when you, the more they can look at it through that lens of colonialism, they'll realize the power that they have and the importance of it. Um, so that was what I, I, I look at it as kind of a wall of, of this history that we're still working on and hopefully that this was one brick I could put in to, to try to help that narrative. So, thank okay, you. Professor Tane, one more question sure. that Rusty, who's our co-founder and vice chair of Brooklyn well, Peace. Thank you for reading, Rusty. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm about to ask the most negative question. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> Save the best for last. Um, yes, yeah, so prior to being negative, um, <laughs> let me throw in that 
Um, I actually, uh, like my, I teach in the university. I actually teach U.S. nuclear policy. Okay. <laughs> and I am a co-founder of Broken for Peace. And when I was young, I was a co-founder of uh, Students for a Sane Nuclear Policy. So I want to get all that positivity out there. <laughs> okay. But you know what? I, I mean, first of all, I share with Molly. You know, I teach this stuff um, to kids all the time. And so, number one, I am struck by the fact that they might get interested, but it's history. It's not anything that's resonating right now, whether they're black or whether they're white. I mean, that they're interested. Um, I would say, in general, I think there's a racial difference in my experience. I think, I think in general, black students, for example, when we study Hiroshima, that they're much more interested and see the significance of it. But, you know, it's not great. But when I think back over you know, all these years of organizing, it seems to me there are two periods where you've had a lot of organizing around nuclear weapons. One was during the Eisenhower, early Kennedy years, when there was an issue of you know, particularly nuclear fallout in the atmosphere. Right? I mean, that you're giving kids leukemia because you're testing all this stuff. And that was constantly talked about, was the danger of that nuclear fallout. And then, when Brooklyn for Peace was founded, it was in the Reagan period. And part of the point there was not just that Reagan was you know, building all this crazy arsenal, but the Russians had one too. And so there was a sense, I think, that many of us felt back then that part of what was really dangerous, this was really dangerous because they could end up in a nuclear conflagration. And so I think at these two moments, these movements grew. And I think young people, as well as older people, you know, could connect to them. But when I think about now, I don't see it in the same way. And I think as the other piece of it is climate issues. That for my students, and they're not activists, you know, they're like in their computers, but they live with the sense that the planet is in danger because of what's happening with climate. And so when you try to bring up the issue of nuclear weapons, um, which you know could have some effect maybe sometime, that feels like a much smaller, more abstract thing to them than thinking about the future of the planet. So I went on for a long time, and it's a negative question, but it's honestly what I feel every time I'm in a classroom. It's like, what's gonna make these kids really care about this issue? And it's very difficult to see it. Um, a couple of things. Um, I mean, we have to understand that we're dealing with, you know, 18, 19 year old kids that my freshmen and sophomores that have never known a world without war. They essentially lived, I mean, for me to remember their age for 9 11, and, and I mean, they've lived with us being at war. So, yes, I think for some of them, they're just completely divorced from it. Afghanistan is a million miles away, nuclear arms is over here, and they're just trying to survive. They're worrying about putting, paying off their student loan check, putting food on the table, getting to their job, trying to get a $15 minimum wage, um, now trying to just get healthy drinking water. So, yes, in that regard, nuclear weapons is over here when you're looking at those issues. Um, when I talk to Black Lives Matter kids, they're trying to make sure they're not killed by the police. They're not worried about a nuclear arsenal. So I get that, which is why I said, perhaps the economic piece is the, is the link that you can use now. I think the other piece is President Obama. Um, you know, for a lot of us, and I put myself in this category, for so long, we have been against the man. But when Obama got in for a lot of us, we were like, what do we do? We're against the man, but our guy's the man. Now what? <laughs> and, and then the venom and the racism came so unbelievable that me personally, it made me pull back from criticizing and I went more into a defense mode of him that maybe I wouldn't have been on somebody else because I look at my students. My niece is nine years old. She's biracial. Um, to have a black president matters. It, it just does. It, in my family, it just matters. So to wake up every day and go, today is the day somebody's going to try to kill this president, his beautiful wife and two daughters. I mean, so I I think there's a part, and where I'm going with this is, there, I think there may be a sudden that once he's no longer president, we'll be more critical of the empire as a whole again, um, because Hillary's a hawk. Uh, if she gets in there, we know that. She's been, we'll be at war for eight years with her. Uh, of course, the other side, God help us. So, um, you know, so I think that's another piece of it. Um, 
so yeah, you, you have to think strategically of how you reach these kids. You're not the first professor. I have professors at American University and others that will tell them the same thing. Toss, they will say the same. We're so frustrated. How do we reach them? I try to get more um, African American students to come with me to Japan. It's an expensive trip. I try to get them. And it's even in Japan. I mean, how, you know how many of my Japanese students, same age, literally have no idea when the bomb was dropped? None. Yeah. Um, so, you know, whether it's Japan, whether it's China, because I have Chinese students, you know, there's the U.S., so much history is whitewashed and, and completely, and so you have to, again, try to look and find other ways. Um, I don't use textbooks. Try to use historical novels, memoirs, try to write books like this, um, you know, instead of the garbage that's out there in a lot of ways that they're getting spoon-fed. So, um, you know, students otherwise, uh, humanities is under assault right now. History is under assault right now, uh, that it is STEM and STEM only. How many of my students will tell me this first week that they're only in school to get paid, right? And I get it. I have hundreds of thousands of dollars in student loan debt, so I know what it's like to be told to go to school just to make money, right? Um, but so they're told, this is your checklist to get your business administration degree to get in and out. Conf we're going to reward you. Conformity gets rewarded. Pass your standardized tests, on to the next thing, get your check. And so to get them to say, no, study history and philosophy and art and creative writing and music and study your passions, um, that's an uphill battle when you have administrations that are running a school like a business. I think those are things, you know, that you have to be, that we're, as, as educators, we're all fighting on a daily basis in many cases, too. I think that plays a role. Um, okay, well, I'm going to be here to sign books, and I'm yes. willing to talk to any of you guys as well. I'm not going anywhere, so again, thank you guys for coming. I really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, thanks so much.